Welcome to Student Affairs Live. I'm your host, Tony Duty. I'm pleased to be joining you from my professional home at Rutgers University. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network, and you can tune in to Student Affairs Live along with my incandescent friend and co-host, Heather Shea Gasser, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. If you're unfamiliar with past episodes, I highly recommend you check out in favor of the archive link that we're sending out now. We're proud to cover important topics with some of the top practitioners, scholars, and experts in the field, as evidenced by our great panel here today. In a moment, I'll introduce you to them, but we can't do that without first giving a shout out to the sponsors that make Student Affairs Live possible. Higher Ed Live is sponsored and produced by M. Stoner, a marketing communication firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Student Affairs Live is also sponsored by ACPA, College Student Educators International. ACPA's strategic partnership with Higher Ed Live calls attention to the pairing of innovative professional development delivery with the strength of renowned professional association. ACPA publishes the journal of College Student Development and About Campus. There are only two days left to register for ACPA 16 at the early bird rate, so please click on the link that we are tweeting out now to learn why you should join us in Montreal. I want to also take a moment to thank Kate Zulo and Carrie Locke who are tag-teaming the monitoring of today's back channel and forwarding me your best content and questions from the Twitterverse. I also want to remind today's audience that these episodes are really designed to be interactive, and your engagement through your questions, your tweets, really improves the quality of the live dialogue. We'll actually take those questions and ask them of our guests. So if you appreciate something you hear today, some nuggets of wisdom, I'm sure we're going to have lots of them, you, and, and you can craft them in 140 characters or less, please share them out with others so that we can extend the learning to everyone. So we put together a, a really impressive, phenomenal lineup today. Uh, their full biographies can be found on the Higher Ed Live website. Uh, special congratulations to Amy as she was just selected for the Shelley Sutherland Outstanding Volunteer Award. Congrats, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to start from left to right. Could, could you each take a, a, a brief moment and introduce yourself for your current roles, how many years you've been involved in the area of fraternity and sorority life? Amy? Hi. Um, I want to uh, just thank everybody for tuning in. My name is Amy Voida. As Tony said, I'm the Assistant Dean of Fraternity and Sorority Affairs at Rutgers. I've been here since um, 96, so I'm almost as old as the institution itself. Um, I, prior to being here, I spent two years at Miami of Ohio in their Greek Life Office, as well as two years at the University of Texas as the Panhellenic Advisor. Um, prior to that, I worked for a year uh, as a leadership consultant for Alpha Gamma Delta. Great. Mark? And good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Hepsel, and I currently serve as the Executive Director and CEO of the Association of Fraternity Sorority Advisors. I've been in this role for three and a half years. Prior to that, I also serve as the Executive Director for the Association for Fraternal Leadership and Values. It's a mouthful. Uh, and before that, I did seven years on three different campuses in the field of fraternity and sorority advising. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Kabadia. I am currently the Director of Fraternity and Sorority Life at UNC Charlotte. Go Niners! Um, I've been there for eight years this May. I have actually been a sorority woman for 15 years yesterday. I became a member of the University of Delaware. I did my master's program at North Carolina State University. Um, and I was the Assistant Director for Greek life at George Mason University prior to being at UNC Charlotte. I'm also on the board for um, the Association of Fraternities and Sorority Advisors, and I'm a speaker for the Catalyst Agency. Excellent. And I just want to note that we don't have a name tag down there for you, but uh, we'll just keep referring to you and your title throughout the show. <laughs> Glitch with the matrix. It's OK. Um, I do want it, Mark, I, just for our viewers' knowledge, Mark is actually live uh, um, broadcasting from, I believe, a United Way lounge in, in Denver. You're you are dinner. correct. You are correct. <laughs> and nice. and Michelle got in on the plane to Boston about an hour and a half ago. So I'm I really speaking, yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate you both uh, figuring out how to how to work this for today. So Amy, let's start off with some basics. What makes a fraternity sorority different than any other student student organization? For instance, the chess club. I think that when it's done right, it really is. Um, 
the only experience a college student will have that they will continue to speak about in a current tense. Right? Everything else that a student does is past tense. You know, I used to write for the student newspaper. Oh, one year I was an RA. When you are a fraternity or a sorority member, you're a member for life. And so um, I think that it's the one thing that really approaches students holistically. You know, we care about your grades. We care about your service. We care about your personal development. We care about your connectivity to other student groups, to other people. And so I think that when done right, <clears throat> students really understand that that is a lifelong commitment and that those are questions you should be asking yourself. You know, am I satisfied with where I am? Where do I want to be? Um, am I being the person that I think that I can be? And so I think, again, it's, it's a very different experience, a very different set of expectations for members than in any other student org on campus. Mark, you, you've been with this for a while. How have fraternities and sororities changed over the last few decades? Yeah, I think we've seen some significant change, actually, over the last few decades, and so much of that really is connected to the same changes that we see across student affairs. Um, our organizations have become so much more diverse, uh, so much more focused on the larger topics of what they were founded to be. Uh, if we go back to 1978, I know that's a long time ago for a lot of people, uh, but this little movie called Animal House came out, and, uh, and it really led us down a path of people believing that fraternities and sororities were really about that social experience. And, and beyond the social experience, I think even living um, that non-value-based experience, you know, the whole party animal kind of mentality, and, and, and we drifted there for a little bit, and we've really focused for the last 25, 30 years on this values congruence conversation, mm -hmm. um, being who we say we are. Um, and, and then when you overlay that with all the changes in higher education and student affairs, a, a very value-centric experience. Um, and I think truly we've got groups that are um, perfect examples of that. And then we have groups that are still trying to be the 1978 fraternity. And so we just keep working to navigate um, along that path. So some people are still kind of stuck back in the day, right? So how, how does the alumni network, uh, what is their role in the current affairs? And, and what are some of the challenges that, that you all have in dealing with this notion of back in my day? Well, I'll go first just to take on what we are talking about. Um, Alumni play such a valuable role, an important role in this experience, uh, and they're very present. And so you can imagine that their presence is hugely impactful on the undergraduate experience. And so, again, it rides this continuum. And so when you have alumni that get it, that are in, um, in sync with their national headquarters and in sync with the <coughs> institution, uh, you can do a lot of good things, but when you have alumni that are trying to live a 1978 experience, uh, through their alumni experience, uh, they kind of take us in the wrong direction sometimes. Um, and so that relationship with the alumni is so important on behalf of both the campus professional and the headquarters uh, in order to make sure that we're all in sync. I would add to that that some of our younger organizations have pretty young alumni who are just not, you know, what you think of the 1978 alumni. These are people who have been out of school a couple of years and their organizations may be 10, 15, 20 years old. And those organizations have gone through such drastic shift in how we used to do things that it's sometimes a struggle for some of those alumni. Like, this is not the way we did it back in our day, and our back in our day was literally five years ago. So connecting with those younger alumni and making sure they are lock and step with what the national organization wants and, and how things have changed. I tell students all the time, the yard is not what it used to be. So you need to really tune in to what's going on, and alumni need to check in. Taking 10-year gaps away from the organization and then coming in thinking you're going to save the day is, is just not really helping any of our organizations. So the more we can engage alumni from the second they, they cross the stage and really keep them connected with their alma mater and with their organization so they're up to date on the happenings of the university and the organization is so important. Right. Well, and if they're not trained appropriately by the national office, right, you know, if they're not current with policy, if they don't understand um, procedure, if they don't really have a good grasp of who is coming through the chapter doors, um, 
figuratively speaking, you know, then they do such a disservice to those students because they are such holders of the culture. If they're not staying current with the culture, they will revert back to whatever it was, you know, that they used to do. And I, I think this is one of those um, opportunities where the alums really, they must be engaged, right, or the, the wheels fall off this wagon very, very quickly. People often gravitate to, to social groups that are most likely to accept them. So age, race, gender, social status, religious affiliation are, are some of the characteristics that can form the basis for these initial interactions uh, and eventual friendships. Several studies have suggested that fraternity life limits students' exposure to people from diverse backgrounds. Michelle, are, are modern day fraternities and sororities as homogeneous as I remember them to be? Can, can you speak to some of the current issues around diversity and inclusion? I think they're not as homogeneous as you may re remember them to be. We're seeing a lot more what you would call diversity, sure, in our organization, and that's everything from race to SES to, you know, what part of the country they're from. We're seeing that. However, yes, people gravitate to an experience that they want. Maybe some of our students want more culturally based experience. Maybe they want more of a, hey, I, this is the image I've always had of fraternity and this is the look and feel that I want. I think the issue we're having is that students who come to college are not well trained in inclusivity and diversity. And we make this assumption that they get to college and they've arrived and they totally know what's appropriate and inappropriate and we can just put them in these groups and all will be well. You know, we were really honored to have Tim Wise speak at our annual meeting this past week and he really opened our eyes to some things that you know the education that students are getting in high school is not really preparing them to be in diverse environments and really understanding what that looks like to engage with people who are not like you so I think that's one of the issues that we're seeing and that's why we're still having issues around poorly themed parties and blackface and cultural appropriation we are still seeing those issues because our students literally don't know better. No one's ever had a conversation with them um, and, and they haven't been exposed to anything like that. I think as administrators we need to be mindful of that. and We need to push and challenge ourselves to have that conversation with all of our students. Our students who may not have been exposed to diversity and inclusion and to our students who maybe diversity is their life and how are they really creating a space where people can come and engage and learn perhaps for even the first time about the differences between us and what makes us the same. I think the cool thing about fraternities and sororities is we can create those spaces. More than any other group on a college campus, we can create spaces where we can have some honest and direct dialogue. Us as professionals need to be well trained and prepared to facilitate those and, and some of our colleagues need to take a hard look at themselves and be like, am I ready to tackle some of those issues? And if not, get the proper education to do so. But I think we're, we're still dealing with this because our country is still dealing with this. And fraternity and sororities are just a microcosm of what's going on in the country today. So we're going to continue to see that until we can have some courageous communities really step up and engage in the dialogue that is so needed. Love it. So, so how do fraternities and sororities both challenge and reinforce these stereotypes and concepts of gender in their everyday practice for anyone? I think that a lot of it goes to like the extremes, right? So I think that with um, the kind of the, the traditional piece, there is always that thought that, you know, the men are hyper masculized, everybody plays sports, we're all jocks. The women are all on the other side, right? I'm prancing around in my Lily Pulitzer dress, no offense, Lily. I'm prancing around in my dress, I'm blowing glitter. Like, I've never blown glitter out of my hands ever. <laughs> ever. And so I think that it looks good. <laughs> you have. Of course you have. Um, I think that it looks good on a video, right? Like, looks great on a recruitment video. I totally want to be that stylized. I want to be that lifestyle, right? But it it only, I think, um, it, it only diminishes the powerful experience that we know fraternity and sorority can be. Um, and I think that's because students, you know, don't really, like Michelle said, they're not well-versed enough and secure enough in the who they are, right? They didn't learn it. No one's ever talked with them about the who they are, what they want to be. So they just kind of revert to what looks good in a print ad or on a video. Um, and I think then some of that reinforcement, again, comes from not being in a, a place where you're going to question the norms, right? When I talk about inviting a date to the date party, if I'm speaking in front of my sorority sisters as the social chair, I will assume my 20-year-old self will assume that everyone is bringing a man. Well, maybe not so much, right? And so I think that's, again, where the advisor support, whether that's campus-based advisors, chapter advisors, like, need to help the students 
frame and just check themselves before they start making assumptions about who is sitting in the, the chapter room. I think also our culture reinforces the hyper-masculinity as well as the hyper-femininity of fraternity and sorority. And our students, some of them are, are, are visionaries and forward-thinking, and, and they challenge that all the time. Um, and we have to challenge that even in our own traditional organization. <clears throat> I know in my own organization, there's a certain dress you got to wear. It's not pants. It's stress. You know, how do we push back on that? How do we let people identify the way that is most comfortable? And isn't that what sorority and fraternity is? At, at the crux is really entering a family and, and being your authentic self. Right. Um, I blame Pinterest. <laughs> are we creating spaces where that can happen? I think, yes, we do reinforce it. We do a lot of traditional things. We still have date auctions. We still have formal and semi. And again, the assumption is you're bringing a date of the opposite gender. And I've had conversations with my students be like, anyone can come, right? Then they're like, absolutely. I'm like, so if I wanted to bring a girl, I could. Yep. If I wanted to bring a guy, I could. Yep. Not all our groups are having that conversation. Not all of our groups are comfortable with that conversation. There are sisters who, hey, I want to wear a bow tie to formal. Is that cool? Absolutely. Some circles, that's great. Some hasn't even talked about. And we do have a, a problem in reinforcing that. Again, educating ourselves on inclusive language and inclusive space is going to go a long way to that. But again, some of our national organizations are not ready to tackle some of those issues. So how do we expect 18 to 22-year-olds to do that? Well, that, so, so that's interesting. We got an email from Alex Silvestri who asked, how are fraternities and sororities supporting trans and non-binary students in organizations that have historically been built on these binary divisions? I, I think there, is, there are some national organizations, probably not enough, that have come out very publicly saying, okay, this is our, it's sad you have to have a policy to say we welcome transgendered folk, right? Like that's just sad. But there are a number of men's and women's groups that have started to come out and do that, which I think has been met with a lot of um, applause and a lot of support by practitioners in the field. I also heard of other national groups that have a policy like that on the books, but they don't make a big deal about promoting it because they don't want people to think, you know, this is part of their big gay agenda or something, which is really sad because we should be celebrating that um, and promoting that um, in terms of inclusion. And, and I think um, some of our groups, that's a great illustration of where we are at the crossroads of the the comfort level that people have in talking about diversity, I think certainly the power dynamic that always exists between a national board and national officers, right, in running an, an organization like a fraternity or sorority. Um, and I don't, I don't know, Mark may be able to speak to more of that if, if in terms of maybe some conversations that he's had as the, as the exec from AFA, too. Well, and I think it's very connected, again, back to that continuum. So we have to acknowledge that we live on this giant continuum and we have groups, we have individuals that fall everywhere along the continuum uh, and, we, and we have headquarters that do the same thing. Um, and I think some of it's connected to individual institutions and what's the environment on that institution. Some of it's uh, geographically connected and, and we have to recognize all of that in this conversation. Um, I do think it is so refreshing to go somewhere like AFA and hear all the stories about trans members who are having opportunities to join chapters and having very um, positive experiences at that. And the membership learning and, um, and, and really digging in and understanding what is it that I believe and why do I believe it and being challenged about that. And it, and it goes back to the conversation that Michelle was talking about. How are they prepared for these conversations going into college? What are we doing to help bring them down that path? And, um, and, and we have a lot of work to do. There's no doubt about it. Um, but as I reflect back on you know, some of how, how things changed over the last few decades, it's one of the biggest changes. Um, I can tell you, when I was in school in the 80s, nobody was bringing, as a fraternity man, even thought about bringing another guy as his date to formal. And now you hear those stories all the time. <coughs> I, I would agree. I applaud some of the emerging groups, a lot, some of the culturally based groups who are tackling it head on. Some of the older culturally based groups, not even touching it. We're not addressing it, not touching it. It does not exist. Um, and we and we need to be honest with ourselves. We really do. And and how do we define membership? And what does that look like? And to be very frank, short of a body check or blood work, you know, which no one is prepared to do. I think we need to really start having some some dialogue so we can be more. Inclusive as a community. 
So, Mark, this question is for you. Some people, actually, Amy, has, has suggested that some of the, many of the good and common practices that have evolved in student affairs have been borrowed from the Greek life model over time. I thought this was particularly brilliant. Go with me, Mark. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. So, what, what are some of the historical contributions that fraternities and sororities have made to student development? Or, yeah, or the student you, affairs best practice, sorry. Yeah, as, as I reflect back on, and I've said this for years, what fraternity and sorority contributed to student affairs, in so many ways it was the foundation of where student affairs grew out of. As we look back a hundred years, uh, there really wasn't student affairs at all on our campuses, but we had fraternities and sororities. And so I think back even to when I was in school, we called where we lived dorms or dormitories. And they were 10 by 10 cinder block rooms. And, and that was about it. Uh, we weren't talking about environment. We weren't talking about um, any kind of community within the space. We weren't talking about living, learning environments. And fraternities and sororities have been doing that for years. Uh, you talk about service and service immersion as part of an experience that we do in community service, and, and fraternities and sororities have contributed that. Uh, they've been so focused on both academic support and, and academic excellence over the years that we've had tutoring and all of that implemented into that experience. So uh, what, I, what I've often been heard to say is I think we created the foundation of what Student Affairs stands for. And then over time, practitioners came in and started doing it better than we did. Right. We got and out now we've got some, <laughs> We did. And now we've got some catch-up work to do. Yeah. So let's turn to the issue of staffing for a moment. I read in a Chronicle article that actually quoted you, Mark, that for every one person devoted to Greek life, there are 750 students, so 1 to 750 ratio. By comparison, the, the ratio of resident hall advisors to staff members and students is about 1 to 20. Greek advisors are also some of the youngest and lowest paid administrators on campus. So I, I suppose the obvious question is, why would anyone want to do this? Amy, you, you're an outlier. You've been in this field for quite some time. I am why? the crypt keeper. I yeah. Am. <laughs> so why do you do it? I have a mortgage. <laughs> um, I, I think that most people enter the profession because they, they truly believe in the work that they're doing, right? And so, like with the AFA Foundation Board, our tagline is because you believe. I don't think that anyone would willingly go into this profession if they didn't think that there was value and merit and worth to the fraternity experience, that they had something, um, they had they had credibility, they had credence, they had some level of knowledge that they could improve the fraternal community, you know, wherever they landed, whether they were at a headquarters or they were on a campus, right? Um, and so I think that <clears throat> passion will take you, passion and idealism will take you probably to about year five, maybe six, right? If you're in a good environment, you have a great supervisor, you have, you have students that are willing to kind of go with you and try something different, and you've got advisors who are moderately clued in, right? I think after that, I think we see the drop-off, right, where people who are like, peace out, that was fun, I'm going to go do something that other people think is more legit, right? Like, I, everyone, I think everyone who's a Greek advisor has always had someone say to them, well, when are you going to stop doing that? When are you going to do something bigger or more important? As if you'd say to the kindergarten student, when, kindergarten teacher, when are you going to start teaching college, right? So I think that um, you've got to really believe in it, and I think that once you hit that five-year, six-year point, then you really, I think, have, um, you've got game, right? You've got skills, you really see the landscape for what it is, and you start to become, I think, more savvy with how do I make it work? Hopefully you're still at the same campus. I think that's a key piece, right? Like how do I create history, credibility, longevity, um, best pra truly best practice on this in this space so that I can continue? I've got colleagues who understand and support my work. I've got history at an institution. I really feel comfor comfortable and confident talking about trends. So I think those are some compensation. Let's be real. Um, I think that, that if you have all those things in place, I think you can keep and retain valuable talent. But I think those statistics at the very beginning in those first couple of years, they're, they're really disheartening. And we talked about those at the, at the annual meeting. And it was 
it, it was, people were, there was an audible gasp. Um, and I don't know, Michelle or Mark, if you guys want to kind of talk about those stats and what you saw. I, I'll speak to why do I do this. One, I'm not good at anything else. But <laughs> I, I, not only do I love this work, I believe it's transformative. I have watched the shy young woman come into the university and me push her. I'm like, sign up for recruitment. You can do this. And then she is sent to Panhellenic president, which is the most powerful position on a college campus, especially when they lead 900, 1,000 women. And I've watched that transformation and go on and have the confidence to do her first job interview and go to grad school. That is a transformative power of fraternity and sorority. It creates a home, a home for people who don't. As a black woman who went to a PWI, I was lost. I was knee deep in crosses and aggressions model. I'm like, where, where do I go from here? And guess what? Sorority saved me. My sorority saved me. They're like, come with us, little one. We, we, we have a place and a home for you. So it means so much to so many people, and it can really transform someone for their lives. For me, there's no greater work on a college campus than really supporting the fraternity and sorority community. And when it's done right, it is amazing. The rock stars that we can produce, the student leaders and the scholars that we produce, I don't know why people don't believe that. And I think a lot of us have to combat that. People, I've also heard, when are you going to stop playing with the Greeks? I'm like, right. why, this is not play for me. This is real life this is real training for leadership. This, this is training for leadership excellence. And you know what? We do it pretty well here. So I think people challenge that. I, I always tell young professionals, there is no shame in wanting to do this for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. There is none. This is noble work. This is work that is needed. And we need good professionals who are willing to engage and stay for the long haul, just like we have people in orientation and residence life and leadership development on campus, Greek life needs you too. And we need good people to stay for the long haul. Yeah, we're not paid very well and we are sometimes the lowest paid professional. a lot of free pizza. <laughs> there is a lot of free pizza. And you know, I have over 2,000 students and between me and my assistant director, we're, we're to manage all of that. You better hope that we're good at our job. That, that's the reality. You better hope that I'm well trained, I have good professional development and a lot of support. Because if not, that could be chaos personified. Yeah. So I think it's really important that we, we, we really tap into the rock stars of our profession at the youngest level and keep them engaged and keep them motivated that this is transformative work, just like any other work at a college campus. Is this where I say, oh, snap? <laughs> As Michelle likes to say, snap, right? So uh, the, at the meeting this last week, I shared with the membership some information. You know, back in the day, Fraternities and sororities were advised out of the Dean of Men and Dean of Women's offices, mm -hmm. which at that time was the equivalent of the VPSA office today. So we went from uh, access at the top of the food chain to now primarily on Stony campuses are seen as entry-level positions. Right. Uh, and some of the statistics that I was able to share is that our average age of members is 27 years old. Um, what that tells me is we don't have a career path in this profession and we desperately need to create that career path. There's nothing wrong with having 27 year olds. We need 27 year olds. But if you look at residence life, you'd never say that a director of residence life should be 27 years old. There's a career path there. And you start as a hall director and you work your way up and as you go you evolve in the profession and that is what we've got to create. The other information I shared is that 62% of our members have only been in their positions for two years or less. Um, and when I think about my own experience, uh, the last institution I served at was Colorado State University. I was there 10 years, and it was in my 10th year that I was just finally beginning, like I was beginning to make a difference. Um, what you do in your first two years is kind of peck away at the surface. You can't make sustainable change in that amount of time. And so somehow, uh, I think we really have to work on our members to understand that, but we also have to get that message out to VPSAs, to presidents, and, and the infrastructure that is, to understand that we need to build a career path, um, or we're not going to be able to create the sustainable change that everybody's calling for. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's funny. There's almost a shame for for being in a particular role at a particular university for, for some time as opposed to the culture of advancement that you've got to jump every three or four years to progress in your career. Perhaps that's something we need to look at more broadly um, in the student affairs field. Well, and a lot of people don't really get fraternity anyway, right? And so I think the, the odd part is when, 
and maybe Michelle and Mark had this experience too, is that as you talk to colleagues and, you know, kind of upon the first meeting of like, oh, what do you do? I work in Greek life. Immediately it's like, oh, well, you know, I didn't go Greek at my school. And it's like, don't care. Didn't <laughs> ask you. <laughs> hey, I cut orientation at my school. I I'm not going to tell you that. I think sometimes... Um, there's a lot of judging in student affairs about what's a what's a valued job and what isn't, and I think there are there are many messages, um, implicit and explicit, that say this is you know this is a starter job only, and that if you're here for the long haul, there must be something wrong with you. So it's a little deflating. Some universities utilize interfraternity councils composed of students that govern the chapters and their members, and, and I read in a recent Chronicle article, or actually the article asked, is it reasonable to expect students to hold their peers accountable when a quintessential college experience, the fraternity party, is on the line? Michelle, do you have any thoughts on that? So I, sometimes I struggle with uh, peer accountability and, and, and looking at my IRC council and be like, can you guys really hold accountable your peers for stuff that you probably did last weekend and just didn't get caught for. I think the answer lies in training. I have to train my student boards in values congruence, what the values of our community are, and what the standards are of our community are. When we skip that, st that step, yes, they can't hold anyone accountable because they don't understand what the tenets and the values of our community to make a great fraternity story community work is. So if we skip that and we don't spend tangible time, not a weekend, not just like one workshop, not just judicial board training, but this has to be consistent over time. This is what it means to hold each other accountable. It doesn't mean your day won't come either if you continue these practices, but how do we create places in our community that there are accountability measures? I think once that is set, it's very easy for students to self-govern. They get it. They're like, no, in order for us to keep having a great time here, doing fraternity for our life, certain things cannot be a part of our community. Hazing, sexual assault, you know, underage drinking, like we have to hold our peers accountable so we can thrive as a community. It's when students are not trained on that. Yeah, I've seen judicial boards be like, no, party, underage drinking, it's fine. Because there was no training and no commitment to the values of the community and their own organizations. So I think when institutions do it well, when um, international headquarters do it well and they really have those, those structures in place, it's a, it's a great thing to have peer accountability. It means more coming from your peers than it comes from me or conduct. I think for some higher level conduct things, I, I think a fraternity party, yeah, that could totally be adjudicated with counsel. Some of the, the more emerging, you know, conduct issues, sexual assault, hazing, I don't know. Sometimes that really needs to be handled by a, a higher administrative body, maybe in conjunction with the students. Are students trained to be sexual assault hearing officers? Most institutions, they're not, but is there a way to have them on the admin panel or the, or the conduct panel <laughs> along with administrators so they can have a learning process as well? I think that's really important, and we need to start taking a critical look at that. But whenever I can have my peer, the peer students hold each themselves accountable, it works out really well because they're like, we did this, and we established what is valued in our community, and the school allowed us to adjudicate that, and that creates respect for our judicial process as well as for theirs. I think there's a lot of reticence, though, across the board with peers to hold each other accountable, and I think a lot of that is because they're not used to doing it, right? Like, you, it is a learned skill skill to confront, right? And so I think, you know, this is the, this is the age of everyone gets a ribbon, right? So maybe I haven't been confronted with poor performance before, but I think one to one in a chapter setting, like, has anyone actually confronted, you know, Sister Susie Q for not paying her dues on time or not coming to meetings? Like, those are easy things to confront on. And if the students are being supported, if the leadership isn't being supported, but again, by the alums, by the advisors, and if they don't have anybody to appropriately model their, their confrontation and their accountability skills after, right, if they don't see that, it's really hard to expect them to come together as a community and to implicitly agree, yes, we're all about the same things, yes, we're all about the same values, yes, there is a line that you don't cross. And so I think because oftentimes they're not, they're not practiced in, in those skills by the time they get to a, a council level, it can be really challenging. So again, I think it plays to Michelle's point about then it's all about the training and it's all about the selection and it's really all about hammering home those points um, because for some of those students, they've just they've never done it before. 
So I want to recite some of the, the many cited accomplishments for fraternity members. I pulled this off of uh, one of the national um, websites. All fraternity GPA 2.912 versus all male GPA 2.89. 39% of senators, 24% of congressmen currently in office are Greek. One half of Fortune 500 CEOs are fraternity men. 44% of all U.S. presidents have been members of the social fraternity, and 31% of all U.S. Supreme Court justices have been fraternity alumni. Mark, what might account for this impressive representation, and, and what are some of the advantages of being a member of the Greek community, and also some of the, the benefits to the community at large? Yeah, I think, you know, as we look at students, you can have two students that are in the same class. They get the same GPA. They get the same education. What they're not getting are those other skills that you learn outside the classroom. And there are lots of places that you can get those. There are a lot of student organizations that provide those opportunities. But fraternities and sororities offer them all in one place. And so when you have a student, say, that goes for a job interview uh, competing with another student, the one that was in fraternity already knows the social graces of how to handle that, that interview. They already know how to work the room. They already know those communication skills. All of that comes to play. Um, and, and I think those are the pieces that you can't learn in any classroom, um, but you do learn through your fraternal experience, and that has a lot to do with it. Um, and, and I think we have to acknowledge, too, that there's a greater network. And we all try to build our social networks and leverage those networks. And um, it's just real. Um, and, and it doesn't matter if you are in the local PTA or in a fraternity. It all works the same way. Um, and so all of that comes to play. So I, I don't want to ignore some of the current issues, some of the problems, such as hazing, sexual assault, and alcohol. I want to start off with a topic that has been in the headlines lately. Amy, can you give us some background on the Campus Safety Act and, and the Fair Campus Act and, and why they're so controversial? What? What? Um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're hard. Um, I think that at the, at the base there are two, I think, struggles that many practitioners and I think certainly many sorority women have with them. I think the first piece is just in the legislation itself, right? So I think there's a lot that concerned people in terms of the position that the bills took on mandatory reporting, right? It has to go to the police before the campus can do something. In terms of how it talks about um, conduct, you know, about the, the threshold of evidence, about, um, I think just, uh, it. they suggested a lot of things that, that survivors and victims advocate groups said were, were not good practice, right, and, and they came down against them. So I think that both bills then kind of of like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a qualified campus professional. Hopefully many people had the not on my campus. We, we, would, treat, we would treat those survivors appropriately and swiftly. Um, and I think so on the surface that was really where most people were in terms of these are bad bills. I think the second piece, though, for a lot of the sorority alumni, and I hope undergrads, I think is that sense of leadership. How did we get here? How did our national umbrella groups say, we support these things when they seem to be contrary to everything else that we stand for? So I think there's, um, there's a lot within the profession and within the membership that has, um, I think it's almost like they've poked that bear, where I think this it's easy to be disengaged with a lot of stuff, but I think when it comes to the really important stuff, I think that's where these uh, these two acts have, have kind of poked a bear. Um, I think that what also has been interesting is to see, maybe unfortunately, I think unfortunately, not all of our umbrella organizations have come out saying like, hey, this is the deal. We don't think these are good ideas. I think some of the the organizational decision making in that way has been well that wasn't really our 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 fight in the first place so we're going to refrain from commenting right there before the grace of God but I think that other people are looking for umbrella groups to say even if we weren't part of the decision making initially we still have an opinion and I I personally think that's important for 
um, for those umbrella orgs, all the orgs, to be able to say, this is what we think, and this is how we got there. So um, it, it seems as if, for now, on the heels of the meeting, both of those bills are are probably less likely to happen than before, but I think those questions of how we will um, treat students and I think how we will then make decisions um, as organizations, I think those will linger certainly much longer than those bills will. So CNN recently, I think two weeks ago, aired The Hunting Ground, a, a movie about sexual assault on college campuses, and the filmmakers had a really strong critique of fraternity system, university administrators, and, and also student athletes. What are some of the specific actions that advisors and administrators can take to deal with this issue? I think, personally, first action is watch the film. <laughs> you, need to, you need to bear witness to what is out there. I actually screened it earlier this year, and it was the Wellness Center on our campus who brought together athletics, fraternity life, student activities, a whole gamut of professionals in, in our student affairs division to watch it, to watch it first and then decide, hey, are we going to screen this on campus? Are we going to invite students? And we rose our hands, me and my assistant director, we're like, yes, we're going to screen it. We're going to invite our students to it because in order to tackle the issue, you must own your part in it and then tackle it head on. I think first you need to look at it. You need to educate yourself. Too many of us are not well versed in victims' rights and advocacy, the policy of our institution, sometimes we're, we are experts in some of the other issues, but what, how do we handle sexual assault victims and perpetrators? What is the policy on that? How is that handled? Is it uh, uniform across the, the board? A re an average student, fraternity person, an athlete, a, a grad student. So we, we really need to take a look at that and make sure we are well versed in the policy. We need to be advocates. And, and whatever training, victim's advocate, whatever training we can get from the institution or going outside the institution, we should really pursue that as a, a strong part of professional development. I, I'm shocked when I hear students, uh, graduate students or professionals don't have access to that. I'm like, well, you need to have access to that so you can be well informed. The reality is we create a special relationship with our students, especially like the highly engaged ones. Are you prepared for some of your highly engaged students to walk into your office and say, I've been sexually assaulted? Are you, are you prepared for that as a professional? Because mm -hmm. many times we're on the front lines, and we need to know exactly who, you know, we're first responders in that, in that way, and, and who do we report to, and what is reported, and what is not reported, and confidentiality. So I think a lot of the education for us as professionals is needed. Second to that is our students. Our students, our students need education. It's not just the, the presidents or the council leadership, everybody. And, you know, we bring in speakers all the time, and I'm a speaker, so I get it, about hazing and other things. But we need to start bringing speakers that make people slightly uncomfortable about sexual assault, about consent, about the things that are really um, hitting our community. I have, uh, I've had probably a sexual assault in our community every year since I've been at uh, the institution I'm at, but there are also subgroups of students that I've, I've heard nothing from. I'm concerned about students of color. There's a culture around that, about not talking about sexual assault and, and not even acknowledging it. And I find it hard to believe that in X amount of years, I've never had a student of color come to me saying they've been sexually assaulted. Statistically, mm -hmm. that almost doesn't make sense. And I'm fearful that education is not happening in some of those groups where they don't have a voice to talk about it because there's a cultural component to that as well. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen from the professional standpoint, but also from our students and, and making sure all students have the language to really talk about the issues that are facing them and, and what is sexual assault and what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. You know, I've heard freshmen talk about things and they're like, oh, my boyfriend did this and we're all looking at them like, that's sexual assault. And they're like, no. I'm like, yes. yes. So do they, are they even equipped with the language to have those conversations and recognize that they've been violated or recognize that they may be a perpetrator? Mm -hmm. Now we've got a few questions from Twitter, and I'm going to finally get to one or two. But I want to, but I want to, I want to finish this uh, this line of, of of issues. So, Mark, there was this landmark study conducted back in the early '90s that found 86 percent of fraternity members engaged in binge drinking. And actually, at Colorado State, I, I don't know if you were there at the time, their Greek system went dry following the alcohol poisoning death at a frat house in 2004. Okay, Tony, we don't say frat. I, I caught myself as soon as I no. said it. I apologize. <laughs> no. What, was, what has the field done to address the issue, issue since then, and is there any evidence that, that's getting better? 
So, answer your first question, yes, I was in Colorado State when that happened, and yes, I was the evil guy behind the whole fraternity, sorority, community um, that went party free, is what we did. Uh, and just a little bit of background on that, we had a young lady that had been all over town. She'd been drinking. She came back to a fraternity house where she felt safe and felt like the men would take care of her. And they should have taken her to the ER, and they didn't, and she did die in the house. Uh, and so binge drinking is a huge problem with college students in general. It's probably a bigger problem in many fraternities and sororities. And uh, you know, that study from the early 1990s has been quite a while now, and a lot's changed. As we look at just alcohol culture in general, I think alcohol and flavored vodka and the drinks of, that they have in hard alcohol is actually a whole lot scarier than the kegs that we got rid of in the early 1990s. Um, and, and we have so much more work to do. What I can tell you is, this is me. Uh, after 17 years working on a campus, seeing things play out, we don't allow students to drink alcohol in our residence halls on most campuses. Uh, in our community at Colorado State, it was about 75 to 80 percent of our students were under the age of 21. Uh, and, my, and my personal feelings were, why are we treating the fraternity sorority houses different than we would treat residence life? Uh, if you are of age and you want to have drinks in your room with a couple of friends, typically those aren't the situations that get out of hand. Um, but it's these parties and the party culture and everything that's associated that does, which is why we went party free and we said your alcohol related events have to be at third party vendor locations, they have to be in bars uh, or other facilities in town that are trained and educated to deal with those situations. Um, we could probably do a whole hour webinar just about this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the flip side is then you have students binge drinking before they go to the party because they can't get alcohol at the party. And those are real things we have to deal with. Um, but if anybody says that we have solved the alcohol problem in fraternities and sororities, they're way off. It's still huge. Um, and it's also a giant problem on our campuses in general. And uh, we have to continue to dig into it. So one of the questions from Twitter, to, to go back to a previous question, was from uh, Dr. Crystal Smith. And she asked, how do we translate these conversations and expectations for those essay pros who have multiple responsibilities, don't, aren't just responsible for returning to sorority life? Well, I'm going to start. I really believe it's about partnership, and it's about partnership on campus. It's about partnership with the international organizations. It's about partnership with our alumni advisors. Um, I think early in my career, I thought it was my job to manage all of this and to create program for all of this. And along the way, I realized there's no possible way I, um, being one professional on my campus, it was actually to 1,200 students could effectively do that. But through partnerships, I could work with other departments in student affairs uh, and those international headquarters and the alumni advisors and, you know, create your team that's going to be able to have a positive impact on the whole. I think it's helping people, too, to prioritize, right? We just said the average age is 26. It's very easy to think you have to do it all, right? Oh, I'll be this one-trick pony. I'll, I will do it. I will do everything, and you can't. So I think a good supervisor is going to help somebody prioritize whether that's my only job is Greek life or Greek life is one of several things I'm responsible for, right? So I think helping to prioritize. Um, I think taking an active interest, right? Um, if I were if I were a student affairs VP, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, just, I, it's all good. I'm sure the 26-year-old's got it wrapped up. I, I, would, I would want to know. I want to know what can I do? How can I message what you're trying to do? Um, so that when I'm at my senior student affairs meeting and someone says, sorry, Tony, frat, I could be like, oh, actually, no, they're fraternities, right? Like, how can I be an advocate for you, for, for our students, for this department? Um, you know, whether that means I'm an advocate for, for funding, I'm an advocate for prioritization, 
um, for whatever, right? But I think helping to prioritize, because there's so much to do, right? I, I got to crack that alcohol problem, then I got to crack the hazing problem. So I think any, any good supervisor is going to help um, someone really understand these are the things we can do, so we're going to do them and we'll do them well. These other things, they may have to wait. I think we also have to re-examine that model. I, I know several colleagues who not only do fraternity life, they do orientation and they do student organizations, all 200 of them. I don't think that model is sustainable. So yeah. what data can we help the Association of Fraternity or Advisors or whomever to really help push the institution along? Like this may have helped 10 years ago when your student population was only 10,000, but now that you're pushing 15, 16,000 students, you can no longer have one professional managing all these places. No one is benefiting from it, and there are some crucial issues in some of our areas that need really the attention of one professional at all times. So how can we push some institutions to really reevaluate their model, or institutions that are well-staffed, maybe a couple of years ago, to again reassess their community and, and say, like, we might need another, another um, person here. We might need someone who does just education and risk management for fraternity and sorority life. That could be a new position. I'll take one because that, those are the things that we're not getting to. Um, you you got to manage the day-to-day. -day. you got to meet with and partner with your international partners, your headquarters partners. But there's risk management. There's education. There's a lot to do. So again, we need to be staffing our fraternity and sorority life areas better, just like we need to staff other areas of student affairs. But this is a crucial and critical area too. And when it's not staffed, Everyone wants to look at the 27-year-old and say, like, why didn't why did you have this? Right. Well, look around. I do everything yeah. else. So I think that those are important conversations that need to happen in conjunction with all of this. So we, we have a little less than 10 minutes left. And from what I can gather, a lot of the conversation <coughs> happening on Twitter right now is really focused on what we can do from a universal council approach to support our students, uh, not just our students, professionals and institutions. So what is happening? on a higher national level to advance this common mission and set universal standards. Can, can any of you speak to that? I'll start by saying we as AFA have been having a whole lot of conversations with NASPA, with ACPA, with ASCA, uh, and, and looking across student affairs to say, just like I was just talking about the partnership on campus, the same partnership needs to happen at a national level. And we need to pull NIC, MPC, MPHC, uh, NMGC, you know, Alphabet continues to go on and on. We all need to come to the table and we need to approach this in a collaborative way. Um, we can no longer work in our silos and be effective the way that we need to be. I, I would agree with you, Mark, 110%. And I'm going to push back a little bit. You know, you say we all need to come to the table. Some people need to be dragged to the table, in my opinion. Come on, come on. Like, no more asking. We need to, alcohol is all of our issue. Don't say it's IFC and Palin's issue. It was certainly my issue when I was an undergrad, and I'm an MPHC member. That's all of our issue. Hazing is all of our issue. Sexual assault is all of our issue. And there, there are umbrellas that want to stay quiet for whatever reason. They may have their other things, but I think it's all, we need to drag everyone to the table to really address some of these problems, that is all of our issues. We do it in different ways. There are cultural nuances to it. I get it. There's a different way I've seen Panelonic drinks and the way, you know, NMGC and Nalfo and MPA, they're, well, we're still drinking. We're still drinking. One of us is buying it. The other one, we're making it in our bathtub. We're still drinking. And the reality <laughs> is it needs to be addressed. And, and it's not just one council's fight anymore. It, and it really never has been. So I think we need to stop pretending like we have different issues. We have the same issue. There are nuances to, to how we do it, but it's all the same stuff, and it, it puts our students in a precarious position. So if us as the adults at the table can't even come here, and i got to drag you to the table, we already have an issue. But if i got to drag you, so be it. Like, let me know where I can pick you up, because these are crucial, and nothing will get solved unless we collaborate and combine our resources together. So I, uh, one, one last question before we get to, to a, a final wrap-up. I, I read, I think it was in Inside Higher Ed, uh, about some administrators who had made some really tough, unpopular decisions that were essentially holding fraternities and sororities accountable. And they wound up becoming a target of, of some really powerful alumni who, who threatened to withhold this donations, and that, that had consequences for, for the administrator. So how can administrators balance their own personal ethics and standards in the face of this really strong opposition? As we all sit and look at each other, 
Um, that, that is a hard conversation that we all have to face, and it happens on every campus, and especially those that have um, these donors that are connected politics. to fraternity sorority. It's, it's politics, and how do you navigate politics? And so much of that's connected to relationships. I think it's about um, understanding where the lines, and do you have the backing of the Board of Trustees? Do you have the backing of the President if you're going to cross that line? Um, are they willing to endure the consequences of crossing that line? And those are hard conversations to have. I do not envy anybody who's put in the place of having to navigate uh, the politics in those situations. Uh, it's very real. It's not only connected to fraternity sorority, but we we have to just know that we're all in this together, and you have to go into it knowing that we're taking the team approach and we're going to stand firm. And it's yeah. okay if we lose some donations along the way. And the truth is, not every institution is willing to lose those donations. Right. I mean, safety has to trump status all the time, right? And that's a that's from the top down. And if you don't have that as part of the leadership, whether the leadership is at a boardroom table for your board of trustees, it's at the interfraternity council table, it's at the headquarters table. If if we're too concerned about how will we look to other people, we we are lost in this game. We are done. So we've covered a, a lot of information. I want to be mindful uh, that Mark needs to get to a an airplane. Um, and and so I know you've got got to get to campus. I got nothing to do, just hanging out. It's all good. No, I know that's not true. <laughs> so, so my final question is, is: Can you all kind of wrap up and, and perhaps share some some resources or some actions that that uh, you'd like folks to take uh, if they'd like to learn a little bit more about what we talked about today? Go, I think, go ahead, reverse order, I, Michelle. I think for for one, a lot of things that we talked about today. Have that conversation with your 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 partners, your your advisors to your chapters. The next time a leadership consultant comes from an organization, be like, hey, what's your national organization stance on X, Y, and Z? Like, what are the resources you're providing your organization? Next time you have an advisor meeting, take ten minutes out. I need to know what everyone is doing at the national level to address, you know, sexual assault. Because the groups that are not will go back and ask their their national people like, hey, what what are we doing? Because I was asked by the institution and I didn't have an answer, and that was a little bit scary. I think that's one of the first initial action items we can all do is really go talk to our our stakeholders and our partners who influence our students on what they are doing on some of these topics that are facing all of our our students. The other thing I think professionals can do is be engaged. Be engaged in whatever association you belong to, ACPA, AFA, you know, SACSA, whatever organization you belong to, be engaged. And if you are engaged to a level where you can be considered an excerpt, present. Share the knowledge um, with your colleagues. If you're doing research, if you've done some studies on your campus, sharing that knowledge is really, really important. I'm, I'm not a researcher, so I'm eating up everything that people are researching at, and I'm, I'm eating it and ingesting it and seeing how it works for our campus. So I think being engaged in a way that is more than just I'm a member is very important. Um, so you can really reap the benefits of your membership and become a better practitioner on campus. And I think the last thing is really tap the people in the field who are doing the work who are doing the work. Of course, AFA has tons of resources. ACPA has tons of resources. But you need to tap in to the people who are doing it. If you have a problem, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call your colleague at an institution that's like yours and say, what are you doing about this issue? Or, or what does this chapter do? I think that's where the knowledge sharing can really be robust and intentional, especially when the campus that's similar to yours and administration that's similar to yours and asking for help. I'm never upset when my phone rings and a colleague is like, Michelle, you don't know me, but I have an issue. I'm like, talk to me, sister. How can we solve it? Because if you solve it on your campus, that means I can solve it on my campus, too. And, and that makes us all better. I'm going to do a little bit of self-promotion here. And, and I talked about it at the AFA conference last week. Here we are as an association. 2016 marks our 40th anniversary. And I'm very excited that in our 39th year, we finally got to the place where we've hired our first director of research and assessments, and we've started collecting data. And I introduced some of that data at the meeting, and in early 2016, we're putting out a white paper that showcases where we are as a profession. It's not about where are we at, uh, you know, what's the value of fraternities and sororities on a college campus. It's really who are we as professionals and where are we at as a profession and what do we need to do in order to build a foundation that, that we can actually sustain. 
Um, and so I really encourage you all to watch for that white paper coming out early next year um, because I think for the first time in our 40 years we're going to have some really powerful um, information that's based on real research that, that we can share. So, um, you know, in the evolution of the association, we're putting our big boy pants on, big girl pants on, and, and we're growing up. So I'm excited to be there. I would encourage people to invest, right? I think um, the programs and the educational piece and the resources, those just don't come from thin air and out of magic. There's only so much that your membership dues are going to cover. So if you are a member of AFA, I'm a big proponent, obviously, of donating to the foundation so that the association can do all the things it wants to do in terms of creating those educational opportunities, engaging the membership. Um, I think, too, it, the, the pocketbook piece also comes in providing enough professional development and support. If I'm that decision maker on a campus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead, send your people to the conferences pony up and let them be in the different memberships that they need to have in order to do their jobs well, right? Again, working in the silo, you do the same thing, you get the same results. So I think that it really is, it's got to be a priority in terms of the funding and how the money is spent so that you're making that investment in yourself, I think, and then you're making that investment in your staff. So we are at the end of our time. I want to thank you, all of your panelists, for, especially for making uh, special arrangements as, as you have with your travel um, and really sharing a ton of information. I certainly learned at least one thing, Amy, thank you, um, not to do. Uh, Heather, Heather Gasser and I will be taking a few weeks off. Of, we'll be back in 2016 with more great episodes of Student Affairs Live, including a great topic that Heather has arranged for called College in the Crosshairs, Administrator's Perspective on Preventing Gun Violence that features NASCO's Executive Director Kevin Kruger and ACPA's Executive Director Cindy Love. Always nice when we can bring those groups back together. You can receive reminders about this and other great shows by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. And you can also browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to our iTunes podcast. I'm Tony Duty. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you make it a great week, and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Take care.